I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I am your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you the 120th edition of this podcast diametrically opposed to the forces of dumbness and stupidity and strongly in favor of everybody becoming smarter, starting with us. This week, we are going to be having an episode that I've wanted to do for a long, long time, straddling the borderlands between nutrition, physical health, and cognitive processes, which maybe should not be surprising. There is a wide, wide borderland between those regions, as we know. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Mark Matson. He's one of the world's leading authorities on fasting, intermittent fasting fasting, caloric restriction, and the effects of these practices on the body and brain. And we'll be hearing from him about what he's learned and what he does in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about something that your body does that you might not have known about. I didn't know about this. I would have totally thought this was just in the realm of the woo-woo, but apparently it's true. Something that your body's doing with a few of the calories that you burn, whether or not you are fasting. I'll keep it mysterious so you hang around until the end, but that'll be in the ruthless listener retention gimmick. But now, as usual, let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smart. This week in neuroscience. So here's one to file under rare neurological conditions that you are glad you do not have, and also glad that you do not need to pronounce on a regular basis. This is prosopometaphors. Oh, Jesus. Prosopometamorphopsia. And I'll tell you what this is. So first, there's a visual disorder called Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's tough to know how prevalent Charles Bonnet syndrome is because a lot of people don't say when they have it. Because what it does is it makes objects appear, hallucinatory objects, just appear in a person's visual field that aren't there. And the person knows they're not there. So it's not like a convincing hallucination that you think is actually part of reality. It looks real, but the person who suffers from this syndrome kind of knows that this this is just a, a visual hallucination. It doesn't convince them that it's there, although apparently these things look very convincing a lot of the time. This isn't something that's going wrong in the eye. It's not something that's going wrong in the optic nerve. So although it's a visual condition, it's not something that's really part of what we think of as, as the primary visual system, but instead the visual information processing systems in the brain. Now, rarer than Charles Bonnet syndrome, but probably equally troubling to the people that have it, is this one. I'm going to try to pronounce this again. Prosopometamorphopsia. And this is a neurological disorder in which faces, specifically, appear distorted. We've talked in some prior episodes about a part of the brain called the fusiform gyrus. This is located in one of the visual centers of the brain called the ventral occipitotemporal cortex. And this part of the brain is specifically fine-tuned towards facial recognition. It's the area of the brain that's thought to misfire when people have, I, th I think it's called like alien imposter syndrome or something like that, where people are unable to recognize the faces of their loved ones as actually being their loved ones. And they think that everybody has been replaced by a lookalike robot because they look visually the same, but they don't trigger the same emotional responses. Anyway, it's a part of the brain that's specifically fine-tuned to faces, clearly a very important part of our neural hardware as sighted humans. But in prosopometamorphopsia, something is wrong with the fusiform gyrus. And I came across this article, this is actually from a few years ago, 2011, but there was a woman in the Netherlands who at 52 years of age came forward, sought out a psychiatrist and said for essentially her entire life, she'd been watching as people's faces slowly turned into dragon-like faces. So she would come into contact with somebody, they'd look normal at first, but as the minutes passed and the conversation continued, they grew long pointy ears, a protruding snout, reptiloid skin, and huge eyes in bright yellow, green, blue, or red. And this is how she had lived for decades. Any significant amount of time around somebody and they would be slowly turning into a scary dragon monster. Apparently, the pattern recognition part of her brain was just overcranked towards the recognition of dragons, because she would see dragons all over the place. They would sort of materialize out of the dark when she was trying to go to sleep. If she stared too long at a tessellating wallpaper, there would be dragons. You can kind of see why somebody might not volunteer this information if this were happening to them. The odds of getting your problem fixed versus winding up in a loony bin seem about 50-50. But she came forward and wound up being worked on by a team of neurologists, including the late Oliver Sacks. And eventually, after a lot of trial and error, they did find an anti-dementia medication that severely reduced the unwanted appearance of these dragons. It was a medication called Rivastigmine, which apparently helps the body synthesize acetylcholine, one of the major neurotransmitters, and has been shown to help early onset Alzheimer's patients recognize their loved ones. And luckily for this woman, it also helped bring the dragons under control. Not surprisingly, prior to treatment, her hallucinations had made social interactions very difficult, but since then she's been holding down a steady job and friends and colleagues say that she has vastly improved. But next time you're feeling down and you're looking for something to be thankful for, just remember that in all likelihood you have a perfectly functional fusiform gyrus, and that is no small thing. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs.
I'd like to give a big thank you to SoCal Psych, who left a five-star review for this podcast on iTunes. He said, I used to look forward to TV shows as a kid. Now I look forward to this podcast. SDS provides great actionable steps for taking care of the most complicated known matter in the universe. One thing which I think is pretty cool, I'm not exactly sure how this happened, but a lot of people are calling Smart Drug Smarts SDS, and, and I don't think that we intentionally ever did anything to propagate the use of the acronym. So the fact that this is apparently a listener-generated acronym makes me feel kind of all warm and fuzzy inside, so thank Thank you, everybody. This was a really active week on email, a lot of information flying back and forth, including people sending articles and recommendations on different people that we might want to interview for future episodes. So thank you to those of you who are putting ideas in the idea jar. At this point, we have a very full idea jar, and we'll be looking to make use of all your clever ideas in the coming weeks and months. We sent out a brain breakfast newsletter today, a little bit late on that, a couple days late, sorry about that, but got a ton of feedback off that one. Apparently, there's a bit of a rumble in the peanut gallery, people clamoring for a few more psychedelics episodes, and we'll see what we can do there. We certainly aim to please, and I think it's safe to say that we have only scratched the surface of that very, very rich and deep topic. Also have some less controversial but equally interesting content coming up. Try to pull together a special Mother's Day episode. We'll see if we can make that happen in time. My mom does not actually listen to this podcast. I think she's maybe listened to like two or three episodes, but she's one of the not not insignificant portions of the population that is scared by the word drug. And try as I might to convince her that we're working to make brains better and not worse, she's still got a bit of the heebie-jeebies. But that doesn't mean that I still don't want to make a hell of a great Mother's Day episode. It just probably means that it will be aimed at moms other than my own. Now is the part of the podcast where I like to remind you about Axon Labs. That is the retail wing of our operation where we've got the two supplement stacks, Nexus and Mitogen, that we released in July of last year. So about nine months old at this point. We'll need to have some sort of birthday celebration for Axon Labs in a couple of months here. The website for that is over at axonlabs.io. And thanks to those of you who have been given those stacks a try. Thanks especially to those of you who are continuing to rebuy month after month or that set up subscriptions. It's great, of course, when people check something out for curiosity. It is even more great to see people continuing to come back for more. If you want even a bit more Smart Drug Smarts than you're getting already, please be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. We call that the brain breakfast. That is meant to be more metaphorical than Hannibal Lecter style dietary advice. But in that, we've got reminders of the things that we've had going on recently, things that we'll have upcoming in the future. Me speculating and riffing on topics both advisable and inadvisable, and also a lot of links to various places around the web, the kind of things that we're reading as we're trying to keep up to date on the world of neuroscience. So if you're a fan of the written word as well as audio content and you don't mind getting one extra email per week, then sign up and check that out. Again, that's smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Last but not least, if you're a fan of Smart Drug Smarts and the kind of topics that we talk about here, I'm going to make a very strong bet that you'll also be interested in a new podcast just launched called STEM Talk. This is coming from Smart Drug Smarts alumnus, Dr. Ken Ford of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. We spoke with Dr. Ford about a year ago in episode number 67, and he and his team work with everything from NASA to amplified intelligence systems to maximizing the cognition of divers during extremely deep sea diving. All sorts of really interesting stuff, and their podcast is now dedicated to talking with the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. That is the claim. It is a bold claim, but knowing Dr. Ford, I do not think that is hyperbole. So check that out. It's just launched. It's called STEM Talk, and we'll put a link directly to it from smartdrugsmarts.com slash 120. I think that's all the catch-ups and monkey business that we got to cover, so let's jump ahead now to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. Mark Mattson. He is a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University and is also the chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging Intramural Research Program. He's one of the minds behind something called the 5-2 diet. Essentially, the 5-2 diet is to eat whatever you would normally eat for five days of the week, but then two days out of the week, eat only one moderate-sized meal between like 500 and 600 calories. And that proves to be a relatively manageable, not difficult for most people to implement way of getting some of the benefits of an intermittent fasting lifestyle with really only two days of the week where your style is cramped versus what you would normally be eating. His work is really wide-ranging, and we're just going to be scratching the surface of it in this conversation. But there is a deep well of information here, more to talk about in the future, I'm sure. But let's jump in now with Dr. Mark Mattson. Our evidence, mostly from animal studies, suggests that challenging oneself intermittently from a bioenergetic perspective can optimize overall health and also brain health. And The two challenges that we focus on are one that everybody knows about, exercise, which during the exercise, it's certainly a mild stress, but it uh, results in health benefits. But the other challenge is going extended time periods without food, or at least time periods that people in our modern societies normally don't go without eating food. So for example, we're doing a lot of work on intermittent fasting, fasting for anywhere from 16 to 24 hours, multiple times a week. And in our animal studies, we show that kind of an intermittent fasting diet has profound 
what we call neuroprotective effects during aging and importantly in models, experimental models that are relevant to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Then at the, at the cell and molecular level, we have shown very clearly that both exercise and intermittent fasting stimulate nerve cells in the brain in ways that help them cope with stress. And at the cellular level, we're talking about things like oxidative stress, you know, free radical production, metabolic stress, the ability to generate enough energy under conditions where the cells may not be receiving enough energy, and then also a kind of stress that's very important for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and that has to do with the stress of accumulation of proteins that self-aggregate amyloid in Alzheimer's disease, which most people know about, and a protein called alpha-synuclein, which accumulates in the dopamine-producing nerve cells in Parkinson's. So the intermittent fasting will protect the cells against the accumulation of those disease-related proteins. So you said you've seen good benefits from both exercise and intermittent fasting. I'm wondering, are those additive benefits or does one take away from the other somewhat if somebody is doing both practices? We can say in animal studies, there's additive effects of energy restriction and exercise on the brain. And we've published studies along those lines where we divide animals into groups where either normal sedentary ad lib feeding, exercise alone, energy restriction alone are the combination. And when we look at uh, endpoints that are relevant to learning and memory, it's better with combination. Humans, we that kind of study hasn't been done, although there's from a physiological standpoint, there's reason to believe one would see additive effects. So, for example, one area that we've worked on a lot is that with fasting, one completely depletes the glycogen stores in the liver, and then fats are mobilized and converted to what are called ketones. And ketones are good for the brain. And we know that combination of fasting, or I should say exercising after having fasted for, say, 16 hours, then the ketones go up even more with the exercise. And these ketones are a good energy source for nerve cells. And they also stimulate the production of proteins we call nerve cell growth factors that play important roles in learning and memory. I think maybe a useful piece of groundwork to lay first would just be to uh, talk about normal glucose metabolism, how during fasting the body burns through its glucose stores, starts dipping into glycogen, and eventually can get into burning fats into ketones and getting into a ketogenic state. Can you kind of walk us through that transition? Yeah. So the, the normal eating pattern of Americans is eating three meals a day plus snacks. So they're eating meals that are spaced out throughout the day. And that type of eating pattern, every time somebody eats, the glucose goes into the liver, it's stored in the form of glycogen in the liver, and then its glucose is released from the liver as needed. And if you eat three meals a day plus snacks, you never deplete the glycogen stores in your liver, so you're always running on the glucose that's released from the liver. However, if you don't eat for around 12 hours, and certainly by 16 hours, you've completely depleted the glycogen in your liver. And then what happens is that the next source of energy is fats in the fat cells in your body, which are released into the blood. They go into the liver and they're converted to what are called ketones. And the ketones are then taken up by cells throughout the body, including the brain. And they become a source of energy to substitute for glucose. Uh, Your glucose circulating glucose levels don't go down to zero. You still have low levels of glucose, but the ketones provide an additional energy source. And so, for example, if you go on a long-term fast, say you don't eat anything for a week, then your ketone levels in the blood, they elevated constantly as the fats are mobilized from your fat cells. Now, this becomes important from the standpoint of weight loss and particularly losing belly fat because if you're eating three meals a day plus snacks, you will not mobilize the fat and or reduce the amount of fat. And whereas if you fast, even for, say, 16 hours, you're going to be starting to mobilize some of the fats. I would love to hear your thoughts from a cognitive perspective on the relative merits of the different types of fasting that someone might do. The occasional full day fast versus daily intermittent fasting with maybe a feeding window of seven to nine hours. And then I guess the third thing that people often sort of group in as a related idea would be a really high fat ketogenic diet where somebody keeps their carbs so low that even though they're getting a normal amount of calories and they're not fasting per se, they never cross the threshold where they go out of nutritional ketosis. 
Yeah, well, the short answer is that we cannot make any conclusive statements on what type of intermittent fasting eating pattern is better for cognition. And the reason is that studies haven't been done where within one study, you have groups that are, for example, limiting their food intake to only six eight, to eight hours a day compared to a group that's fasting completely for two days a week. So we don't have the answer to that. We do know that the studies have been done separately. And in both cases, if we look at peripheral markers of health, like insulin sensitivity, both the time-restricted feeding, limiting food intake every day to six to eight hours, and the several days a week more extensive fasting will increase insulin sensitivity about the same amount. And then the second part of your question was the, I um, can't remember. About ketogenic diets, if somebody isn't fasting per se, but they've got a really skewed macronutrient ratio. Yeah, the ketogenic diets will not increase circulating ketone levels as much as will be occur with fasting. And one aspect of the high fat diets that I think people would have to be careful about is that they tend to be atherogenic, promote atherosclerosis. So in the long term, my own view is that it's better to, it would be much healthier to be on a intermittent fasting diet than a diet where one is eating high fat. So I know that the good scientific responsible answer is always more research needs to be done. But since all of us need to eat something or another, I'd love to hear how your studies have informed your own personal dietary practices, what kind of stuff you're eating, how you're eating it, what you recommend to friends and family members, stuff like that. I can tell you what I do. I can't really make any recommendations without having solid data. What I do is four or five days a week, I don't eat breakfast or lunch. And then I work out mid-afternoon. Sometimes I'll go on a trail run, usually five to eight mile trail run around three in the afternoon or so. Or I'll work out in the gym, say at two, and then I'll eat right after that, eat something. And then I'll work a little more, go home and then eat more. And so I essentially go about 18 hours on those days with no food, and I'm exercising right at the end of that yeah. period. And what I find, and of course this is just anecdotal, but you know, other people I talk to similarly have found this, that if you get up in the morning and go to work, drink some tea or coffee, work through lunch, that this is not only doable, but your mind seems to function better during that time period. From an evolutionary perspective, it makes a lot of sense that the brain should be functioning well when you haven't eaten for a long time. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to compete to figure out how to find food. And that's what we find in the animals. When they fasted for a day, for example, they're much more alert. There's more neural network activity in their brains. Their learning and memory is better than animals that have just eaten. And of course, everybody knows if... So for example, if you eat a lunch, particularly if it has carbs in it, you feel sleepy afterwards. Yeah, siesta time. Yeah, exactly. And I again... Eating three meals a day plus snacks is a very abnormal eating pattern if you think about our evolutionary history and, and what animals in the wild experience today. We're geared genetically to eat intermittently. It makes sense to me that, that our brain would function better when we haven't eaten for a while. How do these ideas play in with caloric restriction, the idea of having a diet where your total amount of calories is perpetually reduced? They've had some really interesting longevity studies with mice and radically extending their lives with a, a caloric restricted diet. I think the studies with monkeys have been less promising. But what are your overall thoughts on caloric restriction? Well, the way I look at it is that overweight human beings definitely benefit from caloric restriction. All of the animal studies where calorie restriction has been shown to extend lifespan, the control diet group is animals that have continuous access to food. And typically, as they get to be middle-aged and older, they put on a lot of fat and are certainly overweight compared to what they'd be in the wild. So the control group in animals is essentially pretty sedentary and overfed. And if we take those animals, reduce their calorie intake, they're healthier and live longer. There are two monkey studies done, one at Was University of Wisconsin, one here at the National Institute on Aging. The Wisconsin group, they fed their control monkeys ad libitum, that is, they essentially ate as much food as they wanted, and then they found if they reduced their calorie intake 30%, they live longer. However, the NIA study, the control diet group of monkeys were given two meals a day, 
and they had a lower body weight to start with, and the 30% reduction in calorie intake below that level did not increase their lifespan. So my take on it is that if you extrapolate to humans, you're overweight, you're going to live shorter than someone who's not overweight, so calorie restriction will be beneficial. If you're already at a low body weight, reducing your calorie intake further may not extend your lifespan much and they have only modest effects on your health. Yeah, I've, I've read about those monkey studies. And the thing that strikes me, I mean, looking at it from the outside in is, are they running short of monkeys? These seem like such valuable studies. It's it's a shame that we've only got a couple of monkey groups, a couple of different parameters that we're doing these long term tests on. It's hard to make a smooth dose response curve when you've only got a couple of groups. But probably kind of a bummer for these monkeys that aren't getting as much to eat as they'd like. But it's too bad that we're not able to get more data out of this. It's true. And the reason is this a practical reason that these were studies over 20 years. It is extremely expensive to maintain monkeys over that time period. So it's just a practical fact. But in rodent studies, kind of studies you're talking about have been done. And there in rats and mice, 30 to 40 percent reduction in calorie intake below what the animals would normally eat seems to give the maximum effect in extending lifespan. If you go longer than that, then essentially get into kind of a starvation type situation where the animals are losing a lot of muscle mass. And as they get older, they don't fare as well. One thing that always kind of sticks in my craw when I'm thinking about fasting and longevity is there's a lot of evidence that that strength is always correlated well with survival rates. Whether you're 20 years old or 90 years old or anywhere in between, the stronger members of the species tend to also be the more likely to survive ones. So I wonder about this when I think about caloric restriction or fasting because it's hard to you know have a good body of muscle when you're not getting as much food as the next animal at the trough. There is good evidence from human studies that people who are able to maintain muscle mass during midlife and into their later years do on average live longer. And that's one thing that's very interesting from the intermittent fasting standpoint that in both animal studies and the human studies we've been involved with, and we did this one study with a group in England where we actually had compared directly a daily calorie restriction diet with intermittent fasting. So we had about 100 women divided them into two diet groups. One group, they ate three meals a day, but they had 25% reduction in calories below their estimated basal calorie intake. Then the other group was two days a week fasting, 500 calories. This was a six-month study. Both groups of women lost about the same amount of weight over the six months, but the women on the what's now called the 5-2 diet, two days a week eating only 500 calories, they maintained their muscle mass and preferentially lost belly fat compared to the women who counted calories every day. So there's an example where, you know, there's a direct comparison between intermittent fasting and daily calorie restriction. And from a physiological standpoint, this makes sense because during fasting, the muscle cells, they respond by increasing their ability to take up nutrients when the person eats. So and that happens by increasing the production of amino acid transporters and glucose transporters also in the membranes of the muscle cells so that when you, you do eat, then the glucose glucose levels go up, protein, amino acids go up, then the cells are much better able to take up those nutrients and incorporate them into uh, muscle mass. Whereas if you're just counting calories every day and don't get this shift, metabolic shift, the muscle cells don't enhance their ability to take up the nutrients as well. Within that study, did one group versus the other find the behavior pattern easier to stick with? Yeah, the, the intermittent fasting diet is easier to stick with. So we gave the subjects questionnaires. They kind of rate their hunger level and mood on semi-quantitative rating scale. And during the first month, it, the subjects on the 5-2 diet, you know, they were hungry on those two days. But by about a month, that completely passed. And then they didn't have hunger anymore throughout the six months and their mood improved. So the women on the daily calorie restriction you know, they have to every day of the week essentially portion their meals and you know, determine how much they're going to eat every day. And it's that's harder to do than just focusing on two days a week and on those two days just eating one moderate sized meal. If somebody is trying to optimize their cognitive performance in the short term, let's say, you know, this week, next week, being clear headed at work versus somebody that's interested in long term cognitive health, avoiding senile dementia, getting Alzheimer's, things like that. Are those two goals, are they totally compatible or is there a slightly different prescription in one case versus the other? I, I can't answer that in a definitive way. What I can say is that you know, I mentioned the kind of diet where skip breakfast and maybe even lunch and, and drink some coffee or tea to have a little caffeine. 
So what's happening with the nerve cells are that to improve the function optimally, one wants to increase activity in the nerve cells, increase production of neurotrophic factors, particularly one we call BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which has been definitively shown to mediate beneficial effects of exercise on cognition. It also appears to mediate beneficial effects of caffeine on cognition, and we know at the molecular level exactly how that occurs. The caffeine will increase levels of calcium and a, and a molecule called cyclic AMP in the nerve cells, and that in turn leads to increased production of BDNF, which promotes the growth of synapses and the formation of new synapses, the connections between neurons that are critical for learning and memory. So to answer your question, and, and I think that uh, both long-term and for acute optimization of cognitive function is a similar approach. Now, one aspect of this we haven't talked about is that the importance of the intermittent nature of the stimuli, whether it's fasting or caffeine or exercise, it's important to have a rest period after exercise. It's important to eat at some point after fasting. It's important not to have caffeine levels too high, too long. And the reason is that during the challenge period, whether it's energetic challenges with exercise or fasting or the caffeine chemical or phytochemical challenge, during that challenge period, the cells initiate signaling pathways that lead to the production of proteins that protect them against oxidative stress and help clear out proteins such as amyloid and alpha-synuclein, which I mentioned earlier. But if there's not a recovery period, then the cells don't have an opportunity to grow. And I mentioned muscle cells. You know, so if you eat right after you exercise and maybe even after you've fasted for a while, then the cells take up the nutrients right away. And the same is true in neurons. We find that during the recovery period, so eating after a fast or resting after exercise, that's when the actual growth of the synapses occurs. So you get during the stress, whether it's exercise or fasting or caffeine, the cells go into a kind of a protective mode. And then during the recovery period, they go into a growth and what we call plasticity mode in the brain. So I guess as, as far as a person's daily productivity cycle, you're waking up with an empty belly from the night before. You're going through the day with no food for the majority of the day, probably getting into a light ketogenic state that would be increasing throughout the day. And then by the time you have your big evening meal, you're probably going fully out of ketosis back to glucose metabolism. I guess as far as your diurnal rhythms, this probably times out pretty well. Yes, there's been some interesting research recently in what happened, some of the new insight into events happening in nerve cells in the brain during sleep, particularly deep sleep. And if we get back to Alzheimer's disease, as you know, people with Alzheimer's disease get the accumulation of the amyloid protein in the brain, and that protein seems to adversely affect their function and eventually contribute to their degeneration and death. Uh, it's been shown by several labs now, and including in human studies, that during sleep, the brain actually removes the amyloid protein from the brain, moves it into the blood, and eliminates it. So this is one of the facts that provides more insight into the, how cycles of mild challenge and then recovery periods may operate optimize the ability of the brain to not only function best during when you're awake, but in the long run, protect against things like Alzheimer's disease. I, I was reading something recently about Alzheimer's and sleep, and there's sort of still being an open question. Is poor sleep causing the brain not to be rinsed out as well of these amyloid plaques that build up and, and lead to Alzheimer's? Or is Alzheimer's leading to poor sleep? Or is it a vicious circle sort of situation? It's, it's a question that, that hasn't been answered, but intuitively one would think that you get into a vicious cycle where the Alzheimer's disease process affects brain regions involved in sleep. And then so the circadian cycle gets disrupted and the patients are not sleeping at night as much as they normally do. And then turn that lack of sleep uh, exacerbates or accelerates the accumulation of the amyloid in the brain because it's not being cleared out as it should be during sleep. Also, Alzheimer's patients, Parkinson's patients often suffer from depression or at least mild depression, that is often associated with sleep problems. And it's very clear in the case of depression that the people get into a vicious cycle where they have trouble sleeping, and then that in turn exacerbates their depression, which then makes them have more problems sleeping and so on. And interestingly, exercise, as you know, has an antidepressant effect. We think, and this is just based on animal studies, that the same may be true with intermittent fasting. 
the animals seem to sleep better and they show some changes in the brain that are consistent with the antidepressant effect, including increased production of BDNF, which in animal studies, BDNF not only is important for learning and memory, but it has an antidepressant effect. Well, that sure jives intuitively with something that I think everybody's familiar with. If you've had something recently, it's just not quite as pleasurable, whether it's, you know, food or sex or, you know, a breath of air, or, you know, any of these things, we tend to get more of a, a pleasure kick out of it the longer it's been since we've had one. Yeah, that's very clear with exercise. People, once they get into an exercise routine, many of them have withdrawal symptoms if they don't exercise and certainly don't feel as good. And we think it's similar with intermittent fasting. Once someone gets used to it, that they miss it if they stop. And that, as you mentioned, the food, they don't appreciate the food as much if they're not fasting. So I think it's true, you know, my own personal experience is that I look forward to eating much more after not having eaten for 18 hours and then right after exercise. And uh, another thing is, at least in the few studies we've done, people don't tend to overeat during the time period they're eating, you know, whether it's a 5-2 diet on the five days that the subjects were told to eat normally, they don't overeat. One thing that seems to be a theme in your work is, is real respect for the rhythms of the human body. There's a time when you want to get into a light ketogenic state. You want to make sure that you're getting your sleep at regular times. I'm wondering about your thoughts on longer rhythms, things like people who think that it, it's good for during the winter months, for example, to go into a, a long-term ketogenic diet phase because during cold winter months, that might have been when carbs weren't as, as seasonally available or people that just try to base their diet on what would be seasonally growing in the area where they live. I'm curious about your thoughts on some of these longer rhythms. They're very interesting ideas that make a lot of sense. Again, from evolutionary perspective, it's very clear that many people get much less exercise over the winter months. And, you know, in that situation, if one keeps eating as much as they do during the summer months, they're going to be gaining weight. And indeed, many people gain weight over winter. So it would make sense. And and this may apply to people who are maybe even normal weight, but gain weight over the winter that maybe during the winter would be a good time to do the intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. And then during the more active periods of the year, maybe add in some extra meals to keep your body weight at a reasonable level. So you have a TED talk that you gave, which I I think was actually the first time I was ever exposed to your work. And in that talk, you took a a little swipe, I guess, at some of the other government agencies. You work with the NIH and you made the point that you are, you know, not beholden to the food industry, not beholden to the pharmaceutical industry, that you're basically there on behalf of the consumer, on behalf of the American eater. And it just made me wonder, there are so many groups in American politics that are getting lobbied. Is anybody lobbying the NIH in particular? Sometimes we can collaborate with drug companies, for example, in doing animal studies with some drug they may have. And we have agreements to do those kinds of collaborative research projects. And certainly we develop drugs at NIH and and then try to license them to companies who can then move them forward to the clinic. And within the NIH, we do small clinical trials of certain interventions. For example, we're starting a study now where we're asking the question whether intermittent fasting can improve cognitive function in people at risk for cognitive impairment because of their age and metabolic status. So we're taking people between the ages of 55 and 70 who are obese and have insulin resistance, and we're going to divide them into two diet groups. One, just give them advice for healthy eating, that's the control group, and then the other group is two days a week fasting, eating only 500 calories on those two days. And then before we start them on the diet, we're going to do a battery of cognitive tests. We're going to do functional magnetic resonance imaging, MRI of their brain to look at activity in nerve cell networks. We're going to take a sample of cerebrospinal fluid, uh, which is the, the fluid that bathes the brain. And that's very exciting because we'll be able to measure many of the chemicals that we've measured in animal brains, such as BDNF and markers of oxidative stress, inflammation, amyloid protein, et cetera. And then we're going to have them two months on the diet, diets and repeat all of these tests. So NIH is involved in, to get to your original question, NIH is involved in perhaps many studies that would not otherwise be done because no one profits from the outcome of the study. 
And that's very exciting for me with my own views on health problems and the pressures put on people to actually have poor health by processed food industry, drug industry, even the medical health industry and education. There's a little emphasis on diet and lifestyle and big emphasis on waiting till someone gets sick and then giving them a drug or doing a surgery to... Yeah, there's just not a lot of money in prevention compared to the, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, money you can charge when there's already a problem started. Yeah. Now, you know, recently obesity, which is actually a risk factor for cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, obesity is now officially considered a disease. And my own view, and actually many others, is that some point soon, the health insurance should cover people to go into like one month rehab. So obese people, overweight people, that they can take a month and health insurance cover it completely and they go like an inpatient setting where they have essentially coaches and cheerleaders and scientists and dietitians to get them on a healthy eating pattern and exercise regimen. And I would predict that many of these people after that month will be able to change their diet and lifestyle long term. Yeah, if somebody can stick with something for 30 days, that's enough time to see some significant changes, especially if, if the person's not in that great of shape to begin with. You can see some really dramatic changes. And with the statistics about diabetes and obesity and general overweightness in America, even if you can do something that's just going to get compliance from you know, one, two, three percent of the population, that's still just a giant number of people. Yes, and we think those people, not only are they going to, if they come out and are able to stick with it, not only are they going to have reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and many cancers, but also their brain's going to function better and they're probably less likely to get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's diseases. So I think the politicians uh, particularly take a short-term view of everything, but in the long run, we come out ahead as far as healthcare costs and the productivity of our society overall with this kind of a proactive approach. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Matson for taking the time for that interview. I feel like we've, we've just gotten one ladle full of information from Dr. Matson. There is a lot of different things that we could talk about. One other major road that I'd love to go down with him in the future is his theory about phytochemical hormesis. If you remember quickly from uh, maybe about 10 weeks ago, hormesis is the idea that in a lot of physical systems, a small stressor can have beneficial rather than negative effects. And the phytochemical hormesis theory is that the reason that a lot of vegetables, fruits, tea, coffee can have brain benefits is that the noxious chemicals that these plants produce Produced to avoid being eaten by insects and other organisms at low doses, at the doses that we would be getting as part of a normal dietary quantity, are actually producing a beneficial hormetic response in the human brain and nervous system. Anyway, a whole other line of questioning, but maybe that's something that we'll get into in the future. In the meantime, if you're curious about implementing intermittent fasting into your own life, there are a ton of great resources online. This is something that's been written about extensively in the past couple of years, but we're going to put together a little Smart Drug Smarts cheat sheet on intermittent fasting best practices. We'll have that up at the page for this episode at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 120. If you've been mucking around with any of the types of dietary restriction that we talked about here, whether it's intermittent fasting or caloric restriction, I'll take this opportunity to drop a small bug in your ear once again that we probably will be doing another seven-day water fast sometime this June. So it's still a few months off, but if that's something that you want to psych yourself up for, I think there will be a healthy handful of Smart Drug Smarts fans and aficionados that will be participating this year. So just something to think about. But now let's move along to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So recently around the Smart Drug Smarts office, we were putting together a little graphical icon that involved a brain. And I naively chose sort of a pink color. In fact, pretty much the same thing as you see on the Brain Breakfast newsletter if you're a newsletter subscriber. Thinking, well, you know, brains are pink, right? And I got a lot of pushback on that. They're like, no, 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 Jesse, brains are gray. And I said, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure the brains are actually kind of pink in their natural habitat. It's brains that have been, you know, sitting out on the counter for too long and are starting to oxidize a little bit that have actually turned gray. And then somebody pointed out, well, hey, Jesse, you're, that doesn't make any sense because there's no light inside of a skull normally, so their brain wouldn't have any color. So that's kind of a wimpy argument. And I had to concede the point. So we never really got to the bottom of that argument, but now there's a new wrinkle because it turns out that a brain actually might have a little bit of light inside of the skull, even in a normal, healthy, non-fluorescing person that does not have an experiment going on with optogenetic markers and things like that. The good old standard issue human body apparently produces a very small amount of light. Now, we all know that there are lots of living creatures like fireflies and glowworms and a bunch of 
deep sea fish that live at insane depths in the ocean that do produce light. This is not unheard of, but I had not thought that the human body fell into this category, and we don't to a large degree. We produce very little light, but humans actually do produce a small amount, and enough that in very special circumstances it can be photographed. Scientist and photography enthusiast Masaki Kobayashi from the Tohoku Institute of Technology set up a very special room completely blacked out. He cooled down a camera to negative 120 degrees Celsius. Apparently cooling the camera was an important part of the process as well. And had five volunteers sit completely naked in the darkness. Not altogether naked in the darkness, but one by one from the sounds of it. And took photos of them every three hours over the course of the day to see how much light they were emitting, what parts of their body were emitting light, and if the amount of light that they were producing varied over the course of the day. So some interesting findings. First of all, the amount of light produced was way, way less than would be visible to a naked human eye. The camera was so sensitive it was able to pick up single photon emission. So the smallest little subunit of light that could possibly be emitted, that's what this camera was capable of recording. Light emissions from the body seemed to peak in the late afternoon, about 4 p.m., and different parts of the body emitted different amounts of light, with the greatest amount coming from the lower face and jaw. According to Kobayashi, the photons emitted seemed to be from random chemical reactions taking place within the body, oftentimes the reaction of free radicals with something called fluorophores, which are molecules that give off photons when they shift from a high-energy state to a low-energy ground state. There did not seem to be any correlation between the warmest parts of the body and the parts of the body that were emitting light. This was a small study, only five volunteers, all male and all, I believe, were Japanese, so it's anyone's guess of different ages, sexes, ethnic groups might glow in different ways, but at least now there's a nifty way to start testing. This still leaves unanswered my question of what color the brain would actually be. I'm not sure if I understand optics correctly, but I think each photon has a wavelength, and that's what determines the color of the light being emitted. The colors in the photo that Kobayashi took were kind of like heat map images, where the color represents the amount of photons, not necessarily the color of the photons being emitted, but that would be another interesting question. It's like, you know, was that a yellow photon or a green photon? What color on the spectrum were the emitted photons? We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode number 120. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, do not be surprised that we have links to everything that we talked about here up at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 120. That's 120. So feel free to spread that link around, tweet it, Facebook like it, stencil it someplace conspicuous, or encourage an attractive person to tattoo it someplace eye-catching. If you missed last week's episode, that was a conversation about the ethics of cognitive enhancement with philosopher Rebecca Roach. And next week, I think we're going to be talking about either cannabis which is one of the psychoactive components in marijuana, not THC, it's a lesser known sibling, or possibly something called the Flynn effect, which is the rather promising finding that human beings seem to be getting smarter at a really, really fast rate, at least over the course of the last 75 years or so. The vast majority of which, I must admit, actually predates this podcast, so I can't in good conscience claim that we are a primary cause of the Flynn effect. But we may have an episode about it nonetheless. You'll have to tune in next week. I will meet you back here then. Same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only, although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not, and the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.